I would like to invite up Dr. Dirk Gleiser, Director of Sustainable Development of Tourism at the UNWTO. And please, all the gentlemen who are on uh, Dirk's panel, please um, come up and take your seats. This panel will discuss some um, sustainability, climate change, and innovation, and how they can work together. And uh, I'll let all the panelists take their seats, and Dirk will be able to introduce them and set up the discussion more properly. Thank you. Courtney, thank you very much. Uh, may I ask the panelists and to join me here on stage, I welcome Mr. Felix Eichhorn, President of AIDA Cruises, Mr. Adam Goldstein, Vice Chairman of Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, International, uh, International Association's Chair, uh, Mr. Jeff Engler, Chief Executive Officer of Wright Electric, Professor Kaipesh, Head of the Center of Agrometeorology and Professor of Climatology at the University of Lubyanka, Slovenia, Mr. Fetisov, UNWTO Ambassador, and Mr. Jung Takashina, Vice Commissioner from the Japan Tourism Energy Agency, Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transportation and Tourism. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a long day, and it's a very serious issue we try to tackle. Um, it is something we want to do interactive. We facilitate for you the possibility to ask us, the panel, here questions from the floor. You are using, ideally, Slido to do so. That way we can rate the questions and give answers to those which are the most pressing in the room. You heard before that innovation is providing us new ways of thinking, new ways of bringing ideas to the industry. At the same time, we have here the representatives of the industry innovating and connecting from their side, all with the same aim, to improve the sustainability. When I spoke to the panelists prior to our, prior to our intervention here, I said our main objective is to wake you up, to allow you, the ministries of tourism, to see what the industry can facilitate, what the industry has available in this area, which is so dear to us, sustainability, and especially against the background of climate change. So against that, I will pass on the first question or statement already to Mr. Goldstein on behalf of CLIA. What is the commitment of the sector um, the cruise shipping sector, which in some of our countries currently is extremely exposed to a discussion of sustainability. What are the steps you plan? How do you have committed already? And what are the steps ahead you think you need to undertake? So thank you very much, Dirk, and good afternoon, everybody. One of the most distinctive aspects of the cruise sector is that we live at the intersection of hospitality and maritime, each one remarkable on its own, but especially remarkable when they are together, as is the case in our industry. There are many aspects of sustainability that we can and I hope that we will talk about, but in terms of demonstrating our commitment, I want to focus for the first part, at least, on greenhouse gas emissions and our response to the establishment of the International Maritime Organization's uh, Greenhouse Gas Emissions Goals. And I should say that we must be leaders. We may be only 2% of international tourism and we may be less than 1% of maritime, but we are so visible and we take so many people on vacation that we have to develop the skill sets and help find the breakthroughs that will allow us to reach or exceed the goals that are out there. So, we became the first sector of maritime in the last year after the goals were established to state our commitment that we will meet the 2030 IMO goals where all maritime companies and ships must be at least 40% more efficient in their use of energy in 2030 than 2008. Obviously, we're halfway through the period. We still have a lot more innovating to do to reach that goal buyer before 2030, but we're confident that we will. Then there are the 2050 goals, to be 70% more efficient than in 2008, and also to cut the absolute amount of, of GHG emissions in half compared to the 2008 baseline in an industry that has been growing and expects to continue to grow. Nobody knows exactly how that will be accomplished today. Our commitment is to be a very active participant 
in the global research and development effort that will have to find breakthroughs in terms of things like synthetic uh, LNG and other fuels, the use of fuel cells and hydrogen and so forth. And ultimately, we have expressed our intention to facilitate the achievement of a carbon-free maritime sector by the end of the century. So again, I hope we can talk about other areas, but in this absolutely critical aspect that directly relates to climate change, our sector has no choice but to be leaders. Thank you very much. And for the audience to know Mr. Goldstein and uh, Mr. Eichhorn both traveled especially for this panel here to St. Petersburg and left a very important trade fair in Hamburg just to make the statement at this very important time for the discussions of climate change and sustainability and very, very grateful for having made that effort. Now, going on to the representative, the president of the AIDA Cruises, uh, Mr. Eichhorn, uh, what is it you think um, is feasible today and was it, what, what are the additional things you see already ahead? And also, what is important for ministers of tourism to take into account when speaking to, um, to us about climate change and cruising? First of all, thank you very much to invite us and uh, speak on this uh, great panel in front of all of you. Because we are partnering all around the world where we send our guests to your great destinations. And uh, we are very happy to have the opportunity today to speak to you because finally it's a teamwork. We jointly have to develop further our steps in reducing our ecological footprints, but also on the other hand, developing further growth, both for employment in your destinations and also in GDP growth. Um, as Adam Goldstein was saying already, cruising is just 30 million passengers out of 1.4 billion tourists worldwide, which is uh, only 2%, only but still one of the fastest growing tourism sectors. And we believe further growth will be only available or only possible uh, with a clear commitment towards more sustainable tourism, and we take our real responsibility in that. Um, as I was invited here to speak a bit of what a single cruise brand can do, I'm happy to talk a bit of what AIDA Cruises as a German leading cruise line has done over the last years and also to offer to you to go on with me but also with my colleagues from the other cruise lines working on joint development of, our, of the ports in your destinations and working on how we can further enlarge our joint business relations. And I think we as crews, as in all other industries, we really have the strong commitment to reduce our ecological footprint. Um, and just to give you one, some examples how we do it um, in our organization. Number one, just nine months ago, we've implemented the first cruise ship in the world, which can run completely on liquefied natural gas, which is the cleanest fossil fuel which is currently available. It is reducing a lot of the local emissions nearly completely or to a great extent and is reducing CO2 emissions by more than 20 percent. Um, we've just been recognized by German government for that new technology to get the Blue Angel, which is kind of an echo label uh, given out by the government, which really shows, I think, the strong commitment we've been there. That was not easy. It was a more than 10 years development, and it has to, behind was changes in regulations worldwide by IMO, but also by Passenger Association, finding new regulations in every single port where we are going, in every single country where we are sailing with those ships. And therefore, sure, we need your support to bring that new technology, which is supporting all of us, into, into operation. Other elements we are doing, but also investments from other cruise lines are out there, shore power connections in our ports, which will give us the opportunity to shut down our engines while we are there and reduce the emissions. But on the other hand, we need your uh, um, contribution to that as well because we need something to, to connect to. Um, third element on our side, and that was just signed last week, so pretty news uh, for us, is the biggest um, installation of a battery pack on board one of our vessels, um, which will give us the opportunity uh, for a certain period of time really taking the ship completely, um, shutting down the engines and run on batteries. So it will be the largest battery installation in the complete maritime industry. And I think also showing here another opportunity how we bring innovation just inside the cruise industry, which roughly has 300 to 400 cruise ships in the world out of more than 50,000 commercial ships, how we as part of the tourism industry can innovate and can lead the complete maritime industry.
Thank you very much. And now we turn to the gentleman who's joining us on screen, Jeff Engler, developing electric aviation for EasyJet. Jeff, please, why, why do you think that EasyJet, or what were the reasons that EasyJet, uh, a low-cost carrier, very often being uh, named as one of the reasons why tourism demand and um, travel, which is not sustainable, is developing, why did a company uh, focus on electric aviation? Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, uh, I wanted to share a brief presentation about uh, what we've been working on. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great point what the gentleman um, on the audience uh, in the panel said. And what we're thinking about is uh, the next 10 or so years of air travel. Um, can I confirm that you guys can hear me OK? Uh, OK. Um, so the, the opportunity is um, low emissions and zero emissions air travel, uh, and also ships as well. So what we're looking at is up to 40% lower emissions in our uh, hybrid electric and, and fully electric airplanes. And in fact, actually, ships uh, that we're working on right now uh, can be completely zero emissions. So the work of liquefied natural gas is um, absolutely the latest step for right now. And then this is looking for uh, travel for, let's say, the next decade or so. Um, on the air side, we've been working with uh, airlines such as EasyJet and also Viva Aerobus in Latin America, uh, airport infrastructure operators like JetX and large uh, multinational, uh, multi-billion dollar um, technology providers and aerospace and defense companies such as BAE Systems and a few others. So I, I think that the point is that uh, the, the next generation of air travel is here. Uh, the next generation of ships are here. Um, and, and the question is really, how do we go from technology readiness to actually making products that are on the market? Um, and not surprisingly, uh, capital is what's needed. Um, conservatively, when you look at everything from technology development to certification, all the way into building new facilities and for things like production, it's, it's many billions of dollars of costs. Um, and that's kind of the problem, but the opportunity is that uh, if you look in the private uh, equity markets, there's over $2 trillion of what's called dry powder. In other words, money that's been committed towards investment and new opportunities, that, but that hasn't yet been spent. Um, and so we see that as a major opportunity. And then I think the question is really how to engage uh, that private capital to get people interested. Um, and that leads me to the people in this room. Um, as has already been discussed by another one of the panelists, um, numerous maritime organizations and, and other uh, agencies around the world have looked to uh, decrease their uh, consumption of, of, air, of air fuel uh, and also shipping emissions as well. Um, and what that does, it's, it's, it sounds like a small thing, but what it does is it, uh, it increases the incentives for the private equity markets to get inside, in, to get inside this uh, as a potential opportunity. Um, and so what we're thinking is it, there might be people out there who want to um, increase their own uh, green credentials uh, by announcing, for example, a reduction in uh, air travel or ship travel, let's say, by, uh, by let's say, 2050. Um, and in terms of what's needed, there's three general areas. Number one, legislation. Number two, um, governmental funding opportunities. For example, in the United States, there's organizations like DARPA and NASA that do funding, and, and other uh, countries in the world have similar things. And then obviously getting the word out around marketing. Um, we actually put together a report around this. So if anybody's interested, you can email me. Um, th this is going to sound a little bit cheesy, but what's really needed is the people in this audience to move um, the world forward and to uh, in allow technologies that are being developed to actually hit the market. Um, and I guess at a high level, what I would say is together we have the opportunity to make the world much greener um, and uh, more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Engler. And, and it is interesting for the audience here also to know that there are other countries having made the commitment to electrify their aviation 
sector and most prominently there we have uh, the commitment of the government of Norway by the year 2040 to have domestic aviation electrified. These are commitments which are in the end encouraging innovations to take place, capital to be, to be released and, um, and uh, facilitated. This possible framework, this ecosystem is necessary and our discussion shall shed light on, on the different interests from the transportation sectors. But um, I turn now to Professor Kaipesh and uh, just a piece, additional piece of information. She uh, was the vice chair of the IPCC when the IPCC together with Al Gore were winning the Nobel Peace Prize. That is an achievement and um, from, from your perspective, when, when that happened, you, looked, you started looking already at the tourism sector and if you have then started looking at the tourism sector, are you satisfied with what has happened since then? Yes, to be honest, regarding rhetorics, a lot has changed. So tourism is discussing climate change as a serious issue. But when we go look at the numbers, how the tourism as a business it is expanding, so then I'm not so satisfied because the idea of uh, perpetual growth in tourism makes all efforts being more efficient sort of it undermines these efforts. You were saying about your ships, that your ships will be much more efficient as a single ships. But how many new ships will be there? So this is the problem. Uh, and technology cannot keep up with the progress in tourism. And uh, another thing I, I have found out is that usually your decision makers sitting here, ministers, very high level people, many of you probably underestimate climate change, how much it will hurt tourism sector. And, a lot of people from policy making, they think it's in, it is an environmental issue. Uh, like ministers for environment will deal with that, or climate negotiators. So I'm asking you, have you in your countries really established targets for tourism? You from the tourism sector. We've heard about targets because without numbers, we will get nowhere. Even you put it so nice, I don't know how to achieve these targets, by the end of the century, but without targets, you are going blind, if I may say so. So uh, I think that uh, maybe some comments also, I was impressed by uh, Norway decision that they will go electric, but we are talking about small planes mostly. Don't be fooled fool that the big planes carrying 300 passengers will be electric so soon. And also, when my observation, I studied physics, I know a lot about life cycle analysis, and there is no zero emission electricity. Electric car is not a zero emission car because you have to build it, you buy a new car, it has batteries, and a half of the countries presented here, your electricity is still coal-based. Even in Denmark, for instance, it's not renewable and energy. Of course, Norway is an exception. So there are a lot of things that has to be discussed very honestly. And the word I really enjoyed to see today was a uh, speaker from uh, artificial en uh, intelligence field. She put optimization. Because we, if we are serious to change our habits and to save the planet, maximization, which is in your mind, I guess, at the moment, should be replaced by optimization. So this is my observation so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I ask the organizers, please, to put up the Slido sites, uh, slides so that we can see the questions which are popping up and uh, encourage you to vote so that we are addressing the questions you have. Um, while we are doing so, um, I turn to uh, Mr. Fetisov. Um, th this morning when I joined here um, uh, another conference, um, uh, where the tourism sector in Russia was discussing um, the sustainability agenda, your name popped up all the time. So you must impress, you must impress in such a way that even when you are not in the room, people are quoting you. Why is that happening in the tourism sector? What is your formula of success to have such an 
significant impact on the discussion of sustainability here in Russia? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Secretary General, for the excellent job so far and the team of the UNWTO. It's very interesting uh, discussion and uh, very promising and uh, practical for the future of the tourism. And of course, it's, uh, for us, it's uh, one of the biggest country in the world right now, and uh, our biggest treasure is our, uh, our uh, environmental and eco uh, uh, future. And of course, we need uh, to be uh, up to date to, to realize you know, all this new technology, all this new uh, uh, comfort of the lives. It's, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, already too much. You have to kind of balance to, to find in you know, a proper way. Uh, and of course, you know, for me as a uh, ambassador for the UNWTO, I also am an ambassador for the um, Arctic and Antarctic. And uh, uh, yeah, it's very um, common things to talk about uh, how the uh, tourism as an industry can help the, uh, for the environmental challenge right now. And of course, I got to prepare some speech, and uh, if you can let me, I can speak in my uh, native uh, language. Can I? <laughs> uh, so can I do it? Yeah, please. Yeah. Еще раз спасибо. Я надеюсь. Всем гостям нашим нравится а, пребывание в Санкт-Петербурге. Ну и а, я буду встречать вас в Москве, тех, кто согласился. Я думаю, что вы тоже порадуетесь за то, что происходит и в нашей столице в отношении туризма и все, что связано с современным развитием а, города. А, на, в настоящее время туризм является одной из самых быстро растущих отраслей в мире и в качестве посла а, туризма по, а, и посла ООН по Арктике и Антарктике, хотел бы обратить ваше внимание на роль, которую эта отрасль сможет и должна играть в защите окружающей среды на нашей планете. Мы а, разделяем эту планету с 9 миллионами видов растений и животных и более чем одним триллионом видов микробов. Наукой описаны менее двух миллионов из них. Если мы до конца не знаем, кто они, мы еще меньше знаем о том, что они делают. Но мы знаем, что без них не было бы нас. Кислород, которым мы дышим, чистая вода, которую мы пьем, пища, которую мы едим, зависит от других форм жизни. Природа бесплатно производит все это, что нам нужно. В мае этого года Организация Объединенных Наций опубликовала доклад о том, что около миллиона видов животных и растений находятся под угрозой исчезновения. Причем во многих из них срок идет на десятилетия. Мы превращаемся в астероид, который убил динозавров и полностью изменил нашу планету. Мы превратили половину обитаемой части нашей планеты в производство продуктов питания и заменили диких животных на домашних. Сегодня 96% массы млекопитающих – это мы и наш домашний скот. Только 4% – это все остальное, от слонов до тигров и панд. В океане около 90% крупных рыб – это от акул до тунца и трески – за последние 100 лет фактически полностью, полностью исчезают. 93% рыбных запасов эксплуатируется максимально, через, чрезмерно эксплуатируется и уже практически уничтожено. No, not too much. Okay. Uh, something misunderstanding. Туризм, возможно, является наиболее важной экономической силой, поддерживающей сохранение нашей планеты. Ничто другое не принесет сопоставимого эффекта. Минимум один парк существует в каждой стране, и люди туда с удовольствием ходят. Устойчивый туризм, связанный с сохранением биоразнообразия, может быть беспроигрышным. Существуют готовые решения, проверенные по всему миру, для значительного увеличения доходов от туризма в парках с инновационным продуктом. 
То есть мы говорим о том, что Турим сегодня может помочь при правильном использовать отношение к природе, как раз помочь мы принести деньги для того, чтобы это все держать в соответствии с экологическими стандартами. Ну, тема Арктики, она тоже очень важна. Я думаю, что в ближайшее время это будет одним из главных тем, и в том числе и мирового туризма, но надо очень внимательно и бережно относиться к тому, что на самом деле будет происходить с туризмом в Арктике. Так, <смех> буду короток. Да, но ну есть примеры бережного отношения, да, это, это национальный парк в Руанде, мы все знаем, что это является домом для некоторых из последних горных горел на нашей планете, а также является одним из самых успешных экотуристских маршрутов. Именно из-за хорошо организованного экотуризма сегодня в Руанде возможно, в общем, содержание и развитие этого удивительного животного. Ну, нам необходимо больше территорий охраняемых. Мы обязаны в ближайшее время до 50% всех территорий нашей планеты в общем, превратить в охраняемые зоны. Ну, и это связано с Мировым океаном тоже. Так что мы считаем, что туризм при всей ее затратной части может быть хорошим стимулом для того, чтобы попробовать сохранить планету для будущих поколений, для развития туризма. Спасибо. А то, что касается Российской Федерации, то мы еще раз понимаем, что туризм, экотуризм, это то, что мы хотим сегодня внедрить как стандарт, будет серьезным инструментом для того, чтобы найти средства на огромной территории, в общем, держать экологическую систему в порядке. Так что да, будем взаимодействовать и с туризмом, и с экологическими организациями в нашей стране. They follow the games and you know you have to be uh, working hard play every possible shift uh, you on ice and uh, do your job for a hundred percent again you know it's uh, I know you'd uh, try to uh, figure out a formula of success for me but uh, again you know it's um, 73 time 73 titles uh, as a hockey player I know how we can uh, Uh, work together as a team, and I think uh, we should build, you know, it's a very uh, strong team right now to, to, to face and challenge all these uh, necessary uh, uh, problems. And of course, again, it's, uh, um, you have to be consistent, you have to know what's the sustainable uh, development of the uh, everything, supposed to be as a system, not as a uh, one uh, Uh, direction and of course you have to see the big picture before you know it's uh, going to fix the biggest problems you know it's you, you you played really well because right now i have the right question from our colleague from deloitte ivan big picture and you must be a character who can fight that were the two ingredients he was just giving us to lead the sustainability discussion is that what you see in the world of enterprises as well being the top ingredients Thank you very much, Dr. Glasser, uh, for your question. Um, what we see as a professional services firm um, is we tend to see everything as a project. Um, and where the most successful projects come are the ones where we work together with a big list of collaborators. So we form consortiums, effective partnerships, and when we tackle you know, the problems together. And what we tend to see from Our market research as well is that the innovation, it very close, closely follows the sustainability concept as well. And where we see the biggest results is when the multiple industrial players actually come together um, and work together to you know, achieve a more sustainable uh, future. So for example, in the hotel industry, there's many examples where construction um, progress and technology and innovation is creating um, you know, carbon neutral uh, hotel buildings effectively. And 
I think this is, from, from our perspective as a professional services firm, is where we really need to look into is in terms of SDG 17, where, you know, in, in true partnerships, the real innovation examples uh, and good consortiums will come together uh, to help you, you know, tackle the uh, big and well-known problems we have. Interesting. Um, the partnership role and um, the, the importance of innovation will be highlighted um, by the next T20 meeting taking place in Japan. Mr. Takashina, um, wh what is it a state and national administration, especially responsible for tourism, needs to do to facilitate that and these, these framework conditions enabling sustainability? Yes, thank you very much and good, af good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to briefly explain the recent situation in Japan on tourism and innovation. So tourism is one of the main pillars of Japan's growth strategy amidst the falling birth rate and an aging and declining population. And we are working to achieve the target of 40 million annual international visitors by 2020 and 60 million by 2030. Achieving these targets are very important for us, but at the same time, uh, we need to make a shift towards a more sustainable tourism and to maximize contribution to the SDGs. And we believe innovation in digital transformation play a key role. Innovation uh, may give the solution to the challenges such as addressing climate change or saving energy consumption. So let me touch upon recent examples in Japan. As for the electric uh, propulsion vessels, a passenger ship powered by only electricity was completed for the first time in Japan in June this year, and it is appreciated in its quiet navigation by those who came on board. Concerning electric aircraft, Japan made a roadmap to start the electric aircraft business in 2023, and we will promote necessary measures such as fixing standards for aircraft safety and skill certification and setting up takeoff and or landing places to achieve the roadmap. Digi digital technology uh, also is expected to bring about new sustainable tourism solutions, uh, such as more effective monitoring of tourist inflow and multilingual communication support. In Japan, in order to solve various social challenges through digital technology, the government created the strategy in 2017 uh, for the utilization of public and private data. Within this strategy, tourism is positioned as one of eight priority areas and is the basis for developments such as open data on tourism, the construction of smart cities, and automatic driving technology. In addition, Japan plans to promote the introduction and popularization of services known as tourism mass, mobility as a service, that enables the searching of the routes to destinations and the payment of multiple tickets all at once. So finally, uh, let me brief, briefly introduce G20. So this year, Japan is a G20 chair country, and we will host G20 tourism ministers meeting uh, on October 25th and 26th in Kuchan, Hokkaido, Japan. We set the theme of the meeting as making a shift towards a more sustainable tourism and maximizing its contribution to the SDGs and one of the discussion topics is the role of innovation and digital transformation in the advancement of sustainable tourism. And ministers will discuss the topic with the participation of private companies. One example is that the Japan, East Japan Railway Company, one of the largest railway companies in Japan, will introduce public-private partnership on mass as an example of improving transportation, including tourists. In addition, take advantage of this opportunity. Japan is going to organize ICT showcase in tourism, uh, which will demonstrate the potential of ICT technologies, contribution to the tourism sector, such as using drone and balloon with GPS technology for rescue in snow resort. We also held G20 tourism innovation pitch contest, 
with the aim of creating innovation in tourism and realizing the sustainable tourism. The contest has 108 entries from 20 countries around the world, and the final selection board will be held on October 1st. And the three finalists will present the, at the G20 Tourism Ministers meeting. In addition, one of the private company which has been interested in innovation field will organize a matching event between existing tourism companies and 20 startup companies who will be on the final selection of the pitch contest. So I would like to show the outcome, uh, share the outcome of these meetings and events with you, and we hope that through these activities, we are able to continue to promote innovations in its tourism industry. Thank you. Mr. Takashina, thank you very much. We have the industry here on this panel, and the industry uh, can, can challenge us. Um, uh, Mr. Goldstein, uh, the, when, when, when you went out there and uh, worked and partnered with GSTC and WWF, uh, you, you made specific experiences. I think uh, it would be interesting for the, the audience to, to listen to those experiences. Thank you. Yes, I, I would like to offer something for all of your consideration that could apply in all of the 158 countries that I believe are represented here. Something that we as a company pioneered through our relationship with WWF in 2016. And as Dirk mentioned, we worked with the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, GSTC, to identify that there was an opportunity for the tour operators who operate the shore excursion programs that we run in our various ports. And the cruise industry calls on somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 ports. So it's a huge opportunity to become certified as sustainable tour operators. I believe there were no certified sustainable tour operators prior to this effort. We set a goal for 2020 by the end of next year to have 1,000 of our shore excursions delivered by tour operators certified as using sustainable practices. And at the beginning, they said all the things that you would expect these entities to say. They said, this is going to be very difficult. This is going to raise our costs. This is a very hard business. We don't know if we can layer on this additional burden. And our response to that, generally speaking, was, this is the direction that we're going in as a company. And if you want to take our customers on shore excursions, we suggest that you learn how to apply the techniques from GSTC that will gain you the certification. So as I said, our goal was 1,000 uh, shore excursions by, delivered by certified tour operators by the end of next year. So here we are in September of 2019, and we're already at 1,300. 300 ahead of the goal that we set for next year. Once the tour operators got going down this path, and saw that it made for a bit better business model for them, saw that they could claim that as a distinctive advantage sometimes in the various destinations that we visited, and saw that while we may have been the only cruise line that initially required this of them, the next day maybe another cruise line ship was coming to the port, and they weren't going to go back to being a non-sustainable tour operator just because we were the only ones who asked them to be that way, they couldn't operate different models. They had now become practitioners of certified sustainable tour operator behaviors. That could happen in every one of your countries. And further than that, as some of you of course know, GSTC also has a methodology for certifying the entire destination or pieces of the destination as sustainable, completely available to every country in this room and we certainly look forward, not only as a company, but as an industry, to partnering with those destinations that we visit to help your tour operators and your destinations along that path. Thank you very much, and I encourage the audience. We have many questions here, but the voting as such leaves them very close to vote for which of those questions are the ones you, you want to be raised here during the panel. I just want to pass on the next one to Mr. Eichhorn and uh, Mr. Angler, um, wh what will be the tourism demand you are expecting for your products be? Um, is this something uh, only you see or is this something, is this as a niche element or is that as a mega trend while you are adapting your products? 
I think what, what we've seen over the years uh, when Cousing was developing, and still we are pretty small with the 2% as said already before, perhaps we're going to go to 3%, which will be a big development. But I think what for sure is key to that is the sustainable development of our industry. And you've made reference that, yes, we have existing ships. So we are not just talking about new builds and what we can do on the new builds, but also what we can do on the existing fleet, because some of our ships operate for 30 years. So those ships will go into service next year. We'll be still there in 2050, where our joint goal is halving the carbon emissions. I think that will be more demanding from our passengers. And uh, we are working pretty closely uh, with the yards, technical suppliers, but also the destinations to really uh, uh, make sure that we are all committed uh, to, to those goals. Um, and, and I can add quickly from a technology perspective, um, thank you for the question. Uh, we are seeing a large movement towards sustainable air travel. Um, for example, the Flysgasm uh, flight shame movement that started in Sweden. Um, from a consumer perspective, there's a lot of demand for reducing emissions across the spectrum and especially with leisure travel. So we like to think that we're serving primarily uh, travelers first and then, and then that feeds into the airlines and into the shipping operators. So we think the demand does come from consumers and we're looking to meet that demand with lower emissions forms of air and sea travel. Thank you very much. Professor Kaip. My, my comment, it is exactly what I was also wanting to say that innovation in many times people just use technological innovations. But what tourism now is actually social innovation. So the business models that change the approach of people to the tourism, because in many ways, I seen that uh, with this, uh, in, with the younger generation, I will not speak so much about older tourism, that tourism has gone the wrong way. I mean, it's much more about vanity. It's much about partying somewhere. Uh, young tourists actually don't get what the tourism should be. I, I guess that because social innovation did not work on that field. And I really th thank you for that experience because it's not technology. It's about people, about behavior. And you were talking about education in the previous panels. Who is educating tourists? This is the question. The tourist industry should should make them as human being more sustainable, then that they will demand sustainable products. So we are in a loop here. And I guess it's high time that we address such issues, not just technology, because technology cannot save the world. Can I just ask the question to any member of the panel who feels comfortable? It's, uh, what can we, the tourism sector, do about climate change? I think we, we, we discussed it here in general terms, but is there somebody who wants to, to dare give advice? Yeah. If I may, uh, I want to start with the fact that our reality and the reality of the world is that there is a virtually inexhaustible desire of people to see the world. When we talk about growth of tourism, and we consider the generation of wealth and income that is emerging from many of the countries represented in this room who for the first time or in recent years, it has emerged that your citizens have the wherewithal to see the world, you know that they have the desire to do it. This is our reality. We're 10% of world GDP today and we're very likely to continue growing at a faster rate than world economic growth. So the imperative of us to come up with breakthrough capabilities is essential. The role that we play in the world economy is so significant already at this point that when you think about the IPCC thinking and targets and mentality, we simply have to play a meaningful role. There's no alternative. As, you mentioned, as the professor just mentioned, technology cannot do this by itself. It is a set of enabling tools, and it's incredibly exciting that startups and, and larger companies are innovating and using and developing technologies at a rapid rate that we've never seen before. But the commitment of the people, the governments and the private sector actors, has to come now to the fore. 
Just using our industry as an example, as I did say before, we don't today know exactly how we will meet the 2050 goals. Not only that, but because, as Felix mentioned, these ships have 30-year lives, so that ships that are coming in now will only be partway through their life or towards the end of their life as the 2050 goals come along. By 2035, really meaningfully different things have to have happened in the fleet in order to average or achieve what needs to be achieved in 2050. We can't wait till 2049 to do what needs to be done. We have to find out through new science, new technology, and new behaviors of people how to get there faster. And, and I just want to add um, one point alongside that. Um, from a technology perspective, we see the opportunity is there to meet those goals and to get to zero emissions, for example, shipping around the world. You guys are the leaders that help to bring that to the forefront and help make it a priority. So we can be doing the technology, the shipping operators can be supporting it, and it's the people in this room that will act as the leaders that actually move everything forward. Thank you, Mr. Angler, and I turn now uh, to the Secretary General who wanted to address us. Uh, very quick comment because all day we are working. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome our high-level guests and want to enjoy uh, the idea of Mr. Goldstein, uh, Mr. Adam. Uh, why? Because this is the first time we, we are together sitting in, in, at the, our event when we have representatives and two, one of the most important representatives from the seaside. And um, we, we need to use this opportunity and we don't have time to wait. So let's use uh, and let's give this kind of recognition the, the ports. Cruise business is maybe more than 20% of whole uh, travel all around the world and we have excellent representatives. We have Ms. Luchka, uh, who has excellent um, experience in metrology, and uh, this is a huge, huge thing for us. Uh, our ambassador, Fedisov, just to forget everything, he is seven times champion of the world in hockey and two times Olympic Games. Takashina san, from very active and interesting and experienced country like Japan is. Japan had a lot of, unfortunately had a lot of natural disasters, but no one knows better how to solve and how to act in that hard times. And this is another chance to have on the board. We have representatives from air like EasyJet. I mean, we have C, our distinguished guest, so, and um, uh, we have sea, land, and air, and we have excellent opportunity to act. We have excellent opportunity to plan how to forward, and it was really interesting discussion, I think, and many thanks, but back to Adam's initiative. We are glad to hear it, and we are glad, and you know that count on our full support. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and, Dir and Mr. Dirk, who is our director for sustainable development and very experienced gentleman, by the way. And we need, that, that's why I mentioned before, we need to use this asset, you know. This is asset which is not easy to have on the same stage with, of course, our member states. You could not find this kind of communication and this is what I want to use with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General, for, for your kind words and the, the comments. And uh, I, I think that um, the, the element um, you, you all pointed up, um, point, pointed to that, that there's, there's knowledge, there are pockets of knowledge, there's the political agenda, and right now the tourism sector needs to understand that better. And um, I turn again to Mr. Fetisov and, and then later on to Ivan to ask these questions. What, what are these crucial factors to help us right now to come together, as the Secretary General said, not only on stage, but then later on to train? The really hard time before we get the, be, to become a champion, 
we have to train. Yeah. We, we have to sort out the issues. And what, from your experience, looking at the tourism sector right now, would be that, that accelerator we, we need? What components of innovation do we need in there? What components of finances do we need? Mr. Goldstein mentioned before that it is very often then uh, the support, the backing from the established companies helping to, to finance over their prioritized projects. Your experience, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's true right now, sport and ecology, it's uh, three uh, instruments, I would put this way, and it uh, can uh, unite the people on the planet. We got, we got the biggest challenge right now this, uh, 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 related to ecology. And of course, the traveling this, the, uh, also caused lots of uh, pollution and uh, all this uh, uh, necessary disturbance for the, uh, for the mother uh, nature. And of course, we need to use new technology. You have to be educated, like you, know, you said before, especially kids. It's, uh, it's lots of work. It's schools, it's family, it's uh, TV, internet, it's uh, uh, ambassadors uh, who get uh, um, uh, his experience. And uh, I travel since I was 14 years old. You know, it's uh, by the way, by those times in Soviet Union, only, only was uh, one flight per week to. Uh, one country in, in, in Europe or United States. And of course, this was caused more or less uh, disturbance for the uh, ecology. Now we have to uh, find a new, new solution. You have to educate the people again. And of course, uh, the Arctic, uh, uh, I know you, uh, Norwegians also worry about what's going on in, uh, in the Arctic and Antarctica. This is the two more uh, attracting destination for the tourism also. But you need to be very careful to uh, use uh, traveling to not to bring the uh, damage for the uh, environment. And of course it's, uh, but to use the tourism, you have to uh, uh, get those money. You need the big money, uh, by the way, to fix it, what was uh, damaged already. And of course it's uh, political disturbances. Well, everything was going on right now is uh, uh, misunderstanding in different parts, but uh, yeah, we, we should travel, we should uh, see the different country, we can interact in uh, conferences like that, we can um, go and see the football matches and uh, hockey games, and of course it's uh, uh, we educated, we, we know each other uh, uh, better, but again, you know, what I see right now, it's in the, when uh, youngsters, they realizing that the, the planet right now is dangerous, and for them it's uh, uh, for their children, it's going to be not easy to fix it, everything. We have to think a little bit uh, uh, ahead of the time right now to, 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 to bring the new uh, technology, new standards of the, even uh, for the traveling. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's big work ahead, and especially for Russian Federation, you know, it's uh, tourism uh, slowly becoming, you know, it's a uh, uh, big industry here. You know, it's we got biggest territory, in the world, we got national parks, which is uh, so beautiful, and of course, we need to uh, invite also, you know, it's uh, tourists from the outside to see the uh, uh, my country, and you know, it's in, uh, and be very careful when we uh, interact with the uh, with the mother nature. Of course, it's a big uh, work ahead, and uh, of course, it's sport again, tourism and. Uh, Ecology, this is the three things can uh, unite us. And again, without uh, uh, not building the team, you understand what's the, uh, the uh, major challenge, it's you're not going to fix it, everything. I mean, it's one country like uh, United States, or like uh, Nor Norway or Japan, which is look uh, uh, ahead of everybody for the eco standards, but the, the problems uh, with ecology can uh, develop somewhere else in a different part of the United you know, uh, planet. And of course, we need the uh, same standard for everybody. And of course, many countries don't have enough money to fix it, uh, what's going on uh, is ecology, but we need to get the uh, uh, sources to help them from outside. Again, I travel a lot lately, and you know, it's a problem in Africa, uh, uh, no rain. Uh, 
problem in uh, even in Finland, you know, it's uh, um, the climate get warmer, and you know, it's uh, uh, and change the life of the people. You know, it's the the, the animals dying, and of course, you know, it's. Uh, to, to get there, to see what's going on, to pay your money and to get this money to, to, to fix it, problem, probably it's all, also it's a solution, but we need to be very careful with uh, what we're doing right now. And uh, of course, it's uh, build the team, and we probably have a team here in, uh, in St. Petersburg to understand this is the biggest challenge for us, ecology. And of course, tourism have to be a uh, little bit refocused in uh, 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 new, new, new way of the development, the travel, I think. Thank you very much, Mr. Fetisov. I, I think there is time for a maximum of two more questions. I just went through the list to see which of those questions were answered already, and I put one to the panel. Why can't the tourism sector use its massive economic power to force more rapid climate change progress, climate progress? That was you asking the question. Do we have an answer for that? Maybe part of the answer is what I said before, that usually when you come to climate change negotiations, there are people there from environmental sectors. I've never seen negotiator about climate change goals coming from tourist sector. So I think the tourist sector is itself in many countries was not interested enough to join these uh, COPs, for instance. Not, uh, they were always people, also in IPCC, I remember coming from tourism as observers. They never really felt a part of it, and uh, that's maybe part of the answer. But may I, when I have my last word, maybe just say another thing. Today we only talked about mitigation of climate change. But before you is another huge challenge, is how to adapt tourism to new climate. Your ports will not be the same. Ski resorts will not be the same. Lakes will not be the same. Arctic is not the same. So how to change the tourism on that spots where no longer they could provide the old tourism? What is the new tourism, the optimized new tourism? So it's a double challenge because even if we stop our emissions now, climate change is here to stay. So I really urge you to make programs also in that direction. But business can help because your business is again heavily involved in adaptation. So please do not talk just about emission, but what to do with people who are vulnerable, already vulnerable to climate change. To end, and there are a lot of combination where you can do adaptation and mitigation with the same measures. So the smart ones kill two birds with one stone. And now I have the final question. I don't know who wants to take that one. Are we prepared to discuss with Greta? Discuss about. No. May, may I start? And yes. Then others could follow. I think what, what Greta really helps is to making everybody aware, every industry making aware that we have to change. And I think that is something we should be all grateful to that movement all around the world, exactly as you said, that every single sector, every single industry. Okay, she's not that all familiar in all parts of the world yet, but at least in Europe, pretty pretty much, and I think... She, is, she will be more than uh, welcome if yeah, she absolutely. wants, and yeah. we can discuss with her. So I think w what is important, what we discussed before, that every single sector understands that he has his role in reducing our emissions, and exactly as the professor said, everybody has to start in his own garden, so to say, and developing that, and I think for that it's pretty helpful. I think what's necessary now to talk on actions and to talk on facts and then find, find real solutions um, in every single um, business, in every single destination, and in every single owns behavior as well of every single um, person on the planet. 
Well, my question to are we prepared, uh, my uh, answer, are we prepared to discuss with Greta would be uh, actually rephrasing that question. Are we prepared to discuss with young people who will carry the burden of climate change we caused? Because there is uh, intergenerational unfairness here. So Greta actually represents young people around the world who are not to blame for climate change. How shall we face them in 20 years if we don't do the action now? Yeah, yeah. we all should prepare to discuss with Greta. I think it's uh, uh, in my duties right now, uh, also as the ambassador of the uh, climate, uh, I talk to uh, lots of different places, you know, it's uh, uh, different countries with the youngsters and very much aware about uh, the climate situation right now. And of course, the, the uh, Greta, she uh, did a good job and I think it's uh, everybody uh, on the planet have to think about uh, uh, what we're doing. Start from yourself, you know, it's uh, think a little bit more ahead of the not uh, uh, comfort of your life, uh, uh, but think about, uh, you know, what uh, kind of problem it's uh, discomfort can bring for the future. Of course, we need some time to stabilize the situation, maybe to pay more attention to to protect the, uh, the very important ecosystem right now to, to, to stabilize the situation. And, uh, yeah, it's the kids like Greta, they, they, they show us example how uh, they care about the, our planet, how they care about the uh, environment, how they want to build the team uh, uh, from kids around the world, you know, to, 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 to bring the awareness, to bring the message, uh, send the message, I mean, to the, to the big business, to the governments, to the societies, <clears throat> and uh, of course, uh, to, to, to talk about the uh, climate situation, you need the huge money right now. Maybe you have to think uh, uh, a little bit more about uh, this in, the, in the different stages, but again, it's, uh, 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 in New York, uh, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be it's a big discussion in the UN uh, platform about the uh, climate and uh, future development of the, our planet. Uh, many places in a big danger right now, and they need the understanding. And it's, uh, of course, it's very uh, important to see how the kids are reacting on what's going on. And I think it's we all, again, supposed to be ready to discuss with Greta about uh, what his, uh, she worried right now, what she wants to, from us uh, to do for, for, for the future. I find it slightly awkward to refer to somebody by her first name when I don't actually know her personally. But I would say in our sector on the maritime side, we are quite used to the European Union speaking with a powerful voice within the International Maritime Organization. And there's no question that the IMO has been responsive to the pressure from the EU over these last years, certainly before the new EU government that's taking shape now. I, I want to come back to the Secretary General's comments because I think the opportunity here strategically is how is this UNWTO forum going to be used in a more effective way, not only to converse and, sh and understand where the EU wants to go because there's more to the world here than just the European Union, but to bring those powerful regional voices somehow into this environment to use the assets exactly as the Secretary General said and make this a really compelling forum for how 10% of the world's economy is going to address the, the, the pressures of climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think if I may add to that um, what we presented here two days ago um, to the Committee of Tourism and Sustainability, the first insights, the facts. Facts are fundamental in this discussion. And um, producing the evidence was taking the organization it was the top priority for, for our organization to produce and update the climate figures for the tourism sector, the transportation component, which brings this discussion to an objective level and takes the emotions out. That is a fundamental element in any progress, bringing the parties together to the table to discuss the, the priorities, what was sent before, and then to properly invest and support the initiatives. 
I thank my dear panelists very much for this discussion. It's um, a wide uh, range of um, uh, representation here from the tourism sector and from those who are uh, uh, having heavy experience in the field of sustainability. And I uh, wish that the audience is giving a hand of applause to the panelists who have been here answering questions and, and trying to <laughs> trying to give a way forward to this discussion. Thank you very much.